introduction to the um, background of the rivers, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, but is useful to get the context for why we're mapping risk in the way we are. Then it moves on to what we do and kind of our experience of enabling risk mapping at catchment scales and kind of how that works. And then finally, I'll leave with some thoughts um, on how you can do this with or without FreeUp, um, just so that we can all together kind of drive towards a more positive future. So water risk mapping at catchment scales, um, why do it? Um, this picture kind of uh, nicely articulates what rivers um, should be aspirationally. Um, they should be kind of value to society and an asset that we can draw down upon um, going forwards. But obviously the state of rivers isn't as it should be in in um, general. Um, Ellie, sorry, to quickly ask, um, are there any people not from the trusts or Casco? Um, looks like no one's popped anything in the chat. So um, do carry on as, as intended, Tom, I think. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for that. So the this is the background part of the talk. So as we're all very aware of, and this is pulled from the Rivers Trust report, um, we can all look at these pie charts and facts and figures, but the rivers in England are not in a very good state. Um, this is for a multitude of reasons, and quite a lot of it is the human impacts that are being put upon these rivers. A rule of thumb, which I'm sure you're um, aware of, is that you should be able to look into kind of pretty much any stream in the UK, and if they're under natural good um, conditions, you should be able to clearly see the bottom of the river. And in my ex personal experience, that often isn't the case. Um, also, as a point of reference, a lot of Europe's rivers are in a similar state to our rivers as well. It, it's not complete parity, but they're more similar than they are different. So this isn't just a UK problem. This is actually a much wider problem. So to start addressing risk, we need to know what we're aiming for, which is what my opening slide was about. It's kind of healthy rivers that are sustainable and can be here for future generations and also used as an asset today. So that's the target. The problems we have to overcome, one of them is humanity's impact on them. So understanding the sectors that are responsible and their actions that make these things happen is a good place to start. So not surprisingly, kind of 60-ish percent of the impacts come from agriculture, given the fact that 71% of the UK's total um, surface coverage is owned by farmers. It seems reasonable to think that there's quite a large impact there, simply because they cover roughly three quarters of the UK itself. The water industry has been in the press a lot recently. Um, and again, they are using a kind of Vic Victorian sewer system made kind of a long time ago that inherently has a few um, unanticipated effects during rain events. So again, that's quite understandable that that has causality on the rivers as well. Um, urban and transport. So these are uh, the micro pollutants that run off from car tires and other assets within urban environments. This one's much more interesting because the agricultural and water industry impacts typically tend to be um, factors of kind of nutrient loading or water scarcity and, and those types of attributes. Whereas the urban and transport is, is much more about kind of hydrocarbons and things that are even more niche and more difficult to measure. And then of these four um, bullet points, the one that I think is one of the most interesting is the not known. So the fact that we don't actually know exactly why the river is in a poor state or where these um, impacts came from. Because it's my opinion that if you understand what's causing a problem, you can at least then have steps towards mitigating it and improving it. So there's other, other three bullet points. We know kind of the cause, we know what we're aiming for, so we can start to look at improvements. But I do think in many ways it's somewhat unacceptable that a lot of rivers have this kind of not known status against why they're in poor health. So it's really required of us to understand the backdrop as to how things can be improved. So those are the sectors. So moving on to some of the actual actions and activities that are leading to these failures. Again, this is pulled from the Rivers Trust report. So the ones in red, kind of orangey, are those associated with the utility sector. The ones in yellow are mostly associated with the agricultural sector. And then the one in blue is kind of linked to urbanization. So again, it makes sense when we look at risk to assess the things that have the biggest impact and also the things that we are actually able to change. So looking at the continuous sewage di discharges um, is obviously a very good thing to do. And I do think it's because of the public interest that the um, um, eight um, changing with the price review. So, so PR24, Price review 2024 then changes what the utilities do for the next kind of five year um, block of work. And that starts April next year. 
So that has approximately 10 billion pounds of spend against improving um, sewage di discharges. So in many ways, the monitoring people have been doing, um, the public outcry or the public opinion of that has driven some change there. The agricultural side of things is not in the news as much, but as you can see by this data, it does still have really quite a meaningful impact on water quality. And that is related to nutrient runoff from applying too much slurry or fertilizer at the wrong times, not optimized practices, and again, having kind of poor soil management. So when we're thinking about the things we want to have an effect on, these types of activities are some of the ones which drive the biggest decrease in water quality and various issues. So they also make sense um, to be the ones to target. And then finally, which this will end the kind of introductory part um, of the presentation. We're also dealing with things beyond our control. So by 2070, these are the facts and figures that will happen. So the winters will be potentially 30% wetter and the summers will be 60% drier. The winters will be one to 4.5 degrees warmer and summers will be four to seven degrees hotter. This may not seem that bad, but it actually can be really quite terrible in terms of outcomes because, so this is comparing 90, 1990s data with 2070 predictions. And I know it's fairly obvious, but I think it's worth highlighting is that when, when rain falls on a um, catchment, so the catchment is the area of ground upon which when precipitation falls, so uh, rain, snow, all of that kind of stuff, it will exit to the sea via one um, location. So that's where the river gets its water from. It's from all the land where that precipitation falls. When you get that initial precipitation landing on the ground, some of it evaporates away again. Some of it is um, perspirated away by plants, and it has other mechanisms apart from the river itself to exit the um, system. So once you've saturated the ground, and it's percolating through various aquifers, you can then start to get the uh, washover events from the surface or kind of other flooding activities. So you need a certain quantum of water to fall on a catchment for it to become wet enough to then start flooding. And then every drop of water beyond that initial amount of water directly contributes to the flood. So actually having a 30% increase in our winters will cause a much bigger impact than it seems on the amount of flooding because that that land mass will already be saturated. Equally, in drier summers, because some of that water is lost through the mechanisms that I've described very briefly, it means that actually reducing kind of up to 60% in some locations, the amount of rainfall will actually have a really dramatic effect on water availability. And there's already plans with um, kind of Thames Water and other utilities about getting kind of water from Wales to make sure that the southeast isn't starved of water during the dry summer. So these really will be very, very large effects and having 30% more rain in winter when we don't want it and 60% and less rain when we really need it can have quite dramatic effects. Equally, temperature is a really big driver of various effects. So the temperature at which um, various fish, fish species um, eggs hatch and other kind of um, biological activities occur is driven by that linkage to temperature. So increasing the water temperature actually has a very detrimental effect on those species returning year after year. And there's actually now evidence in Wales that a species of trout has almost been lost and salmon as well um, from the UK because the water temperature has increased year on year and it's now just too warm for that species to be present. That isn't really anything that humanity's done. It's just because the world is warming. So again, that isn't very um, good either. And then finally for this slide, when you heat up water, it can hold less gas. Um, and one of those gases obviously is oxygen. So if you heat up a body of water, there's less dissolved oxygen. So less things um, can survive in it. So in summer, we'll have kind of an air temperature that will be four to seven degrees warmer will have potentially 60% or more dry streams. So the volume of water has decreased. So the amount of energy required to heat up that water has decreased and you've heated the water. So there will be a significantly reduced amount of dissolved oxygen. And again, this can have fairly catastrophic effects on the ecosystem at large. So unfortunately, all of these drivers are coming together in the future, no matter what we do to cause more pressure on these ecosystems, on the availability of water for economic activities, and again, 90% of all humanity's economic activities is driven by water being present. 
And we're seeing some very um, interesting kind of things happening in the US um, on balance sheets against that. Um, so all these drivers are moving in the wrong direction. So when we think about catchments, we think about risk, we think about problems. I think the first thing I would implore you all to think about is, as we know, the problem is much larger than your local stream, your local area problem that you have a great interest in. It's part of this jigsaw puzzle of much bigger um, factors at play. And it's only, I think, by zooming out and looking at the whole problem and then zooming back in again, can we really mitigate the correct risks rather than being at risk of fixing the wrong thing. And again, in the UK by 2070, we'll have a 7% increase in population. And that almost means we have kind of like one in 10 people more. And during droughts, the British public somehow um, have used actually more water per person during a drought than they do when there isn't a drought. So again, that could be a very compounding issue as well. So moving on to risk and what we, we mean by risk. So for us and the way that we help um, organizations manage risk and kind of move things in the right direction, there's really four levels of risk. So there's avoid. So if you understand the problem, you can identify the risk and find an alternative route. The next one, if you can't achieve that, is to reduce or mitigate that risk. So you understand the drivers and you minimize the coupling. So you do you decrease the kind of badness of the outcome based on the same driver still happening. You can transfer the risk, so you can share these impacts um, in a well-informed capacity, or you can simply, as the last option, accept the risk. So to give you an example, again, going back to temperature as the mechanism of this discussion, we know that increasing temperature will have a negative effect on the breeding cycle of a lot of species. We know that it will um, have a detrimental effect on water availability and other attributes that we really care about. So the best thing to do would be to avoid global warming. So whilst governments have said that they're putting a lot of efforts towards that, and there's good data to suggest that that will happen, it seems unlikely that we're going to avoid the effect. So we have to move to the next stage. So then we move into the reduce and mitigate problem. So we can't stop the world from warming, but we can mitigate the negative impact that we care about, which is those fish surviving. So we can plant more trees near waterways. We can provide that kind of shading, that reduces the coupling of the heat and the sunlight warming up the rivers. We can maybe enable deeper channels in some capacity, and that increases the thermal mass. So we can start to have a stream that's more resilient to the negative driver that's being forced upon it. We can transfer the risk. So if we look at a larger scale, we might unfortunately come to the conclusion that we can't plant enough trees, we can't make the rivers deeper. It's simply not going to work. So we can transfer that risk by saying, well, there are other catchments that actually can onboard the species. They can be much more resilient than, say, catchment A, which is what we're focusing on. So we'll transfer the risk of the species loss by an ensuring that the species can survive in other subcatchments. And unfortunately, they'll go extinct within a small local area, but the problem has been fixed in some capacity. And then finally, there's the accept level, which is you accept that the species will no longer be native to the UK but we'll work with other agencies to either kind of ensure that that genetic diversity is maintained or ensure that other areas and countries can look after these species. To run through one other swift example, because this is a very important point um, in the presentation, I think, because people often just look at reduce or mitigate as the only option. So if you considered a um, housing scheme near a floodplain, the best thing to do clearly would be to avoid building houses in that area. Um, but say that you decide that you really do need that housing, so, so you can reduce and mitigate. So the flashiness of a catchment is when it rains and you say you've got concrete everywhere. When that rain hits the concrete, nothing is really absorbed. It basically all flows off very quickly, hits all the drains simultaneously, and that leads to a massive spike in the amount of rainwater that's going through the system. So you go from a very small amount of water to a very large amount of water and then back to a small amount. And it's that instantaneous massive bulk quantity of water that causes your problem. So what you can do in the headwaters, so areas very near the source, so up in the hills, kind of in the farms, you can introduce things called leaky dams. And these will basically retain some flow. So when it floods, this dam will fill up. It'll buffer that volume. And then the dam will leak over the course of tens of minutes or hours. And then that will release the water slowly. So you reduce and flatten out this huge spike into kind of a more broad um, lump that the river can deal with. So you could, for example, in this housing example, say we're going to pay farmers to put in leaky dams because then we can build the houses still, 
in this floodplain because the floodplain won't flood anymore because when it rains really heavily, our negative driver, we can mitigate the houses flooding because of that payment. If you can't do that, you could transfer the risk and there are schemes that kind of do this in an interesting capacity. You still build the houses where you want to, but instead you pay farmers to have interventions so that actually their farms and fields um, flood in really a very dramatic and negative way for them. They're reimbursed for the service. So the risk and problem is being transferred to them, but they're paid for it and they're consenting and it's, it's all very well informed and your housing can still continue. And then finally, on the accept level, you accept that the reason housing is cheap is because it sits upon a floodplain. You get home insurance or as a um, developer, you take up bulk insurance and that's how you mitigate the risk and kind of accept the risk there. So I could talk for hours about this, about how you can go through these four steps. But that's the kind of framing that I think is really helpful when you look at risk and how to mitigate it. And this is the reason that you have the backdrop we have um, for these things, unfortunately, trending the wrong way. So we need to get ahead of these problems. So what we've spent um, probably the last seven years really doing in many ways is enabling the democratization of water quality monitoring, because when you consider that previous slide I was talking about, it all requires good knowledge of what's happening um, on catchment scales. So you need to have the knowledge about where things are happening, how they're happening, what's causing what, because only with that knowledge can you actually mitigate risks. And I'm sure this is this slide and onwards is the reason that many of you are attending the presentation. So we worked really hard on this. So I think you need to start wide and end tall. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you need to start at the wider scales with the kind of lowest resolution to make sure that you've captured the whole problem space to then zoom in further and further and further. So typically, it seems to me, and to free up, that people have very, very expensive sensors because that's until we kind of did what we did, all that was available. It's a very tall solution. So it's a fantastic device. They're typically very, very expensive. Um, they're really accurate, they're fully accredited, but you can't use one or two probes to triage the whole of a river. Um, not everyone's qualified on it. And even if they are, that sensor can only be in one place at one time. So you can never really be certain unless you've lived in an area your entire life that you actually are fixing the right problem. You could be fixing a problem, but it might not be the most problematic problem. So start wide and end tall. So we start off with using the water framework directive um, data. This is the kind of national data that's collected and paid for by us. Um, Europe does the same as well. Since Brexit, we don't really follow the same thing anymore, but I'll call it the water framework directive or WFD for short um, going forwards. So we can provide a backdrop to your starting point. So if you have an area of, of land that's of interest to you, we can basically share and which of the subcatchments based upon that monitoring um, are the highest at risk or have the most negative impacts. And depending on what you're trying to do, are you trying to kind of enable more houses to be built? Are you trying to enable better sewage facilities? Are you trying to kind of look at the risks against um, CSO events as a utility? And as the trusts, um, are you looking to try and get the public to understand the science you're doing far more effectively? Depending on what problem you're trying to do, depending on what risk you're trying to mitigate, it will completely change in many ways what your priorities are. So we can help you start with very little knowledge, if, no, if not no knowledge, very cheaply, select the large areas that are, are of interest to you. So now you understand which areas of interest, you can zoom in a bit further. So you can then have citizen science, get a grab sample, um, use kind of handheld devices. So you can either grab physical water samples and send them off to labs, and then they do all the kind of good scientific work that they do to get that interesting data. Or you can have kind of low cost devices. These things can cost kind of 50 pounds, 100 pounds, um, and it requires you to be there. Or you can leave little data loggers to measure lux. So how much sunlight there is or, or what the temperature is. And you can collect all that information. Um, so that would be the next stage. And as you move from left to right across this page, each kind of next block costs roughly 10 times more than the block before it. So this is why also, starting off with the WFD, then moving to citizen science, then to our low cost hardware, and then to lab and kiosk data, it means that you're paying the least, you're committing the least resources to getting the most knowledge. And I think, again, that's really beneficial of this approach, being data driven. We're not presuming you to have good knowledge of the catchment, because that's the very reason that you're engaging us or others with the work. You're trying to work out what you don't know. So by zooming in in this way, it's the best use of funds. So once you've done the system science and you've now kind of zoomed in further, you know there's some kind of maybe bad actors, there's some kind of 
sites that are of interest to you, you can now start to deploy hardware. You can use other people's hardware. You can use our hardware. We've spent the last kind of five years making our hardware as low cost as possible, um, especially when some providers have a wiper blade on the end of their probe that costs a thousand pounds. It does kind of um, question um, how those costs are arrived at. But it then means that you can, for example, with us, for example, measure dissolved oxygen. That's quite a hard thing to measure by hand. Our things can do it in real time. So a measurement every 30 minutes. Um, and then you can supplement the data you've grabbed by hand with our devices and I'll come on to that later. So now you've kind of worked out where the issues are happening and you kind of want to create some really big change. You can then bring in kind of regulatory approved um, testing, sampling, other equipment. Yes, it has a very high cost, but now because of the three previous stages, you know that is going to the, the point of interest is going to make the biggest difference. So this slide is probably best summarizes what we do as a company, the value we want to add. And please, after this talk, um, reach out and I'll happily have a conversation with you about how we can help or how I can share some of my thoughts about our journey from a solution and providing point of view and how this, I really do hope, will democratize water quality monitoring and enable people to get the knowledge of catchments at scale. Because again, you can only manage risk by knowing what you're aiming for. I think we all know what we're aiming for. You can only kind of mitigate risk by knowing what needs to be changed. And again, we know what kind of sectors and activity that is. And finally, you need the knowledge of what's currently happening. And in my opinion, it's that knowledge, that understanding, that breadth of discovery, which has been the right limiting step because hardware has been too expensive. Getting good scientific data has been too difficult, too expensive, and the collaboration is just too difficult. So what we've worked on is enabling anyone to start from the left and go to the right um, in the most efficient way possible. Another thing we've done is unified the kind of risk measurement. So the WFD has a very scientifically rigorous measurement. Um, and like all good scientific measurements, it does a fantastic job of being accurate and very, very useful. Unfortunately, because of its precision, ironically, it's not um, as transferable to other stakeholder groups. So when you imagine shopping in a supermarket or any other shop where you buy food from, a lot of people consider the calorie count. So Obviously, the kind of calorie count of something like a cabbage compared to the calorie count of something like a small lump of lard, the same calorie count in either kind of scenario has the same energy. So if I ate it, it would give me the same amount of energy theoretically, but clearly they are very different things. So when you simplify a measurement, it can help unify literally apples and oranges in this example, um, but it means that you do lose some resolution. So if you go too far, Yes, everything is equivocal, but actually what value is left? If you go too far the other way, it's scientifically incredibly rigorous, incredibly accurate, but it almost loses some value because it can't be transferred to other scenarios. So what we've done, and, we, and we've tested this with universities and um, landowners, for example, and other stakeholder groups, and this wheel is our version of the kind of calorie count on food and that kind of traffic-like system you see. So we've broken this down and I have to give um, Sam Browning, who's also on the calls um, credit here as well. So he brought to our attention the way that these measurements are done in the US with these kind of six months or yearly scorecards. And again, because we make software and hardware, we want to kind of have this automated and provide this as a, a, a summary tool for trusts or any organization working with the public or other stakeholder groups to unify um, the risks involved. So in the middle, we have the star rating. So this is our version of calorie. So this would be kind of a five star example. We then have the five segments around that wheel, each pertaining to a different aspect of water quality. And those little kind of gold bars that are either filled or empty is the kind of star rating for that subset. So in this example, um, the red segment has no stars and the moving clockwise, we have one star, two star, three star, and four star. And this is just an example. If this calculation was being done correctly, clearly then the um, stars in the middle wouldn't be five star for the river, but I just wanted to show what that looks like. So starting with the water droplet, this is a measure of water scarcity. So is it um, the case that rivers are drying up during summer? Is it the case that they're flooding horrendously during winter? If that was the case, it would get a very low score. If there's a secure amount of water, that would get a, a good and high score. The next one clockwise around is the morphological state. So is the river incredibly flashy? Is it kind of mainly concrete and it's going to cause flooding problems? Is it um, having a lot of erosion, a lot of sedimentation? That would give it a, a bad score. On the other side, um, is it kind of in a good state? It's not degrading. That would obviously be a very positive score. 
The next one around is recreation. So this is one we've added to get more public interest. So I know everyone on the call cares about this. The public, unfortunately, seem to be more aligned with kind of how it affects them. And I fully understand that because they don't have the time to look into everything. No one does. So this is a score about linking to the suitability of a watercourse for kind of public enjoyment. So that will be interesting. The leaf one is the ecological status. So this is the kind of health of the ecosystem in that river. This basically maps pretty much directly onto the WFD um, system. So that will be of interest, I'm sure, to the Trust and Casco as well. And finally, the little kind of um, thistle flask lab bottle is a physiochemical. Again, this maps very well onto the water framework directive data. And that's the kind of the temperature of the water, bulk properties, um, chemistries as well. So we hope that because we can enable you to start from any position and again, start wide and build tall, that will help you get an understanding of the catchment to better assess the risks. Because we have a unified risk measurement, it won't be perfect for anyone, but we think it does a good job of unifying people. If then your focus was entirely on the physiochemical, then you basically zoom into that segment and then that segment will have a further breakdown. But at a high level, we can summarize catchments that are very disparate using this type of technique. So what we offer as a company um, is this dashboard overview. So a lot of detail has gone into things that I won't even mention on this call, but given that the rate limiting step of knowing about risk is the ability to see things from above and to see the kind of overview of a catchment and all catchments are different, all problems are different. And in many ways, I think water quality is a bit like happiness. Um, we all know what it means to us, but it means different things to different people. And it depends on kind of various factors as to what you take water quality to be. So we want to provide, and we do an overview of events. So we aggregate a lot of data, which I'll come on to. And this aggregation means that you can test various um, hypotheses, so thoughts. You don't just get the data, you get the ability to put things into context. You can answer questions. So you can say, well, I've got two different rivers. I know that I'm getting a bit of erosion. I know that the rain is going to be getting worse in winters as the years go on. Um, actually, how is my river performing in terms of sedimentation? So is that affecting abstraction for utilities? Is it stifling life for the Rivers Trust? Is it causing a bulk export of soil from farmer's land? Um, you can answer questions. You've got real-time analytics. So rather than taking um, temporary based samples to do lab testing, you can instead say, well, I know that I have a nutrient problem. So actually I'm gonna take samples when I know there's been a nutrient wash off event. I know when the landowner is putting down slurry or fertilizer, or as a landowner, I don't want to be losing that value that I'm putting on there. So our system then can send you a text message when we see a spike that correlates with rain, for example, and then that means that's a good time to go and grab a sample. If you're going to grab samples at other times, it would simply be a waste of your time. And at it, we kind of want people's time to really go further so people can do good things rather than just kind of spend time when actually there's not as much value with that data. Real-time analytics and notifications I've touched upon, you can start to see various effects. So that is actually a snapshot of our dashboards. And in this example, the purple line, for example, is the turbidity. So this is kind of how muddy the river is. And the green line is some government weather data, which is the rain data. So again, with a single device in a single river, we can say with some confidence that the rain is causing that turbidity. It's not a livestock issue of livestock wandering in. It's not someone building houses or, or doing things they shouldn't. It's actually just a river that has kind of a really quite poor erosion. So you can start to really quiz things and drill down into the causality of these um, actions. So as the trusts, we want to work with you with, with what you already have. So we have made our own hardware, which I will come on to, but you can use us to make your sampling you're doing go further. So you can get grab samples as you do with your citizen scientists or with kind of um, paid assets. Get the grab samples, use the low cost hardware um, that you already own and upload those readings to us. Those readings will then be in context, whether that's measuring phosphates and seeing is it land wash off, whether it's measuring um, kind of other um, physiochemical like PFAS or whatever it is, you can get those samples and upload data to us. That also covers things like infiltration. So things that a probe can't really test for um, and things like the Riverfly method. Basically anything you want to test, you can upload and have that in a geospatially meaningful context. Again, those, those grab samples can be sent off to have ISO accredited lab testing. 
So then that's kind of um, data that can't really be argued with, which again is very valuable, especially when some groups think that there is little value in citizen science data. Um, this can help you bolster the rigor of what's being done um, so that actually it's much harder to argue with. And then finally for the slide, um, third party data loggers, we've got kind of temperature loggers in that image. Again, these are very low cost because they have no real time communications and we can have it so that you can upload your data as well. So we, we can basically work with you with what you already own and provide that kind of overview in terms of software. As I mentioned, we can work with the water from interactive data. So provide that really high level overview. We can provide drone imagery. So when you've got that map view, um, Google Maps is great, it's free. It's, it's a great, great service, but it's often not that up to date. Um, so we can provide drone flyovers to get kind of those vertical pictures of catchments. So again, there could be arguments for doing that four times a year to get kind of the seasonality changes or to map kind of how a certain kind of building um, works has changed the, the course of the river. Um, or various aspects. So again, we think that's a valuable thing that we can drop in. So I know other systems um, do exist, but they tend to just pull in data that is publicly available. Um, they don't often have the ability to actually really work with you to really understand catchments in a way that actually um, matters. As I mentioned, we pull in real-time weather data. So the rain data, um, kind of radar overlays, all that kind of stuff. So if you're suddenly seeing kind of spikes or spills or things going the way they shouldn't, Ron having to then go to the Met Office and work out, well, was that correlated with that? Again, in that brief um, overview that I showed you just before, you can see that you can directly correlate things like rainfall with the, the um, aspects of interest. And then also we, we bring in real-time government data so we can bring in the river levels, um, kind of other aspects, and have that all in one place. So we really provide you the context, not just a graphical information system to hold your data, because if you have just data, you can't really make in informed decisions. So onto our hardware. When we started this work years ago, uh, we actually started on software. So we wanted to use hardware that was out there um, and easily available. And in our opinion, unfortunately, at the time, um, it fell into two, two, three groups, really. It fell into the kiosk, which is basically a, a kiosk is an outdoor cupboard, which has a kind of um, waterproof housing. And it basically enables um, various organizations to put kind of lab grade equipment in the outdoors because they've made it a little pocket of indoors, outdoors, if that makes sense. Um, so they're great devices, but they are very, very expensive. Um, so they're really hard to deploy because you need to really know that you're putting them in the right place. They often require groundworks or you need to have very deep pockets. And often that doesn't really overlap. And so, again, in our mission to make water quality monitoring more um, democratized, we didn't think that was an option. There are lower cost loggers but that doesn't really provide the real time nature of things. You can't get a notification saying, go and grab a sample. Actually, these are the various kind of effects if it's real, if it's not real time, because you don't get that feedback. And then also there was, which I'm still a huge fan of, the kind of more hobbyist um, sensors. So please continue to use them if you have them at your disposal already. But these things, they, they will work, but then under adverse conditions such as um, heavy flooding, um, vandalism, um, leeches, deers, crows self-cleaning, different types of sedimentation, different types of pressures, all those things, they tend to fail because to develop something that will survive is, is non-trivial. So our box, um, you can see it here, um, actually sits under the water surface. So only the antenna, which is that um, little um, square thing just there, is above the surface. And if a solar panel is attached, then that's above the surface as well. Otherwise, the box is entirely under the water. This means it has basically no visual impact, and that does two good things. Firstly, it's not an eyesore. If we're working to really improve these systems and someone goes on a walk or wants to kind of enjoy the outdoors, we don't really want all these kind of things just visually cluttering up that enjoyment and diminishing it. And also, we found that, um, to put it kindly, there's a lot of public interest in hardware and people may steal it or do things with it that you wouldn't expect. So if it's hidden, um, people don't know it's there, so they won't vandalize it, again, enabling us to keep the cost really low. So we can measure things on the left. Um, I'm sure you know what they all are. Temperature is an obvious one. Dissolves oxygen is the amount of oxygen in the river required for things to survive. Conductivity um, is basically kind of a measure of the salts there. So seawater has a high conductivity. River water has a low conductivity. Depth, and this can be correlated with flow. So again, water quantity, pH, um, color. And then turbidity is a measure of how kind of murky the river is. We can also do ammonia phosphate and nitrite nitrate. Um, that's with kind of third party devices um, or kind of sensing, should I say, integrated with our system. So again, it appears seamlessly on our device. 
and I'm happy to talk about this in more detail in the Q&A if you want. So we can collect the information directly ourselves in real time. We can enable you to use what you currently use, keep it as low cost possible. We can bring in that water framework directive data. We can also um, bring in satellite data as well. So we can start to kind of overlay those things, especially from the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Um, that's in in incredibly interesting. We can map your outdoors with drones. And the whole point of this, all of our efforts, is to unblock this bottleneck in terms of the ability of all of you on the call, the public, the regulators, the utilities, the people enabling public money for public good to be spent as effectively as possible. We want to put the catchment in your pocket. So we want you to be able to understand, I care about X. I'm concerned that Y is changing to negatively impact X. And then map how X is changing with time, whether that's flooding, whether that's nutrient leaching, whether it's kind of um, a lack of economic performance, whatever it means to you, we enable you to get the most information, the most insight for the lowest cost possible to then have a data-driven approach to risk, to then increase the resolution about where your problems are happening and to then really focus your efforts down and also to work with other stakeholders. Because if people understand the problem, we found that actually people are willing to change, but often they don't understand why they should change anything because there's basically no feedback. So that's what we do. Um, and now what I'll do is final part of the talk, I'll move on to the some of the other lessons that we've learned. If you don't want to work with us, but you want to kind of just forge ahead and achieve this because it's something that I think we should all be doing. So some of the challenges I think we'll be facing is um, interoperability. So whilst you may be used to doing measurements in a certain way for your river or your catchment, and maybe various systems that really work for you, hopefully I've articulated the, the reasoning required for us all to work on kind of a greater scale as well. So if you're taking various kind of phosphate measurements in a certain way between different rivers trusts or between different kind of asset classes, keep doing that, but try and trend towards an open data standard, whether that's with your um, the way in which your data is saved, um, and integrate with kind of existing platforms and collaborate with in industry stakeholders. So it's all about continuing to do the work that you do, but making it accessible to us. So our platform example, we have extensive APIs. We can work with other people. You don't even have to use our dashboard. The reason the dashboard exists is because people don't have to then build it. But if you have your own system, your, your own tool, we will happily share that data with you through an API because I, I do what I say. And I really think that we need to kind of have this interoperability for things to progress forward. So, th so this is a really, really major one. I know that if you're adopting this, it will cause you a headache because you'll be happy with how things work at the moment. But please do um, consider interoperability um, points. The second of three is um, the value proposition building. So there's a lot of public money for doing improvements. But I think if you're working with other stakeholders, such as um, agricultural um, stakeholders, we need to focus on things that will actually focus on the operations and create a cost saving and a change that they will then adopt going forward. So I've seen quite a few projects where, yes, public money was used. Yes, there was an improvement, but I'm relatively confident the moment that that project finishes, that person, just because that person operating in the real world, will go back to operating how they always did um, because there wasn't a material change um, for the better in, in their practices. So if instead of saying to a landowner, you have a problem with turbidity and that's causing an ecological impact. If you then frame it instead of each year you're exporting 200 tons of topsoil in erosion, that means that your kind of great grandkids probably won't be able to farm this land the same way that you do. And also kind of 500 tons of topsoil costs X. That will probably create a much more lasting impact on that landowner wanting to change his or her or their farm for the better. Um, you focus on, on operations. So don't ask more of people, find a way in which they can alter what they do. So again, um, a well-known example is, is simply the direction of plowing the field can have a really big effect on how quickly water washes off and how much nutrients are leached and kind of the erosion happens. Changing the angle of a plow is something that probably can be done. Whereas asking for them to do something in, in a completely different way is unlikely to have an effect. And again, demonstrating efficiency and qualifying environmental benefits is also something that can really build the value beyond the value we all, we all understand and agree with. It can lend more towards the fiscal value, which is how the world really runs. And the final one in the kind of hurdles that we really experience is the kind of security and accountability. 
one of the first things we always hear is, well, if we measure it and we have bad water quality, um, when you give it to someone else, will we get told off? Will there be a fine? Obviously with us, like that's not going to happen. Um, I can go into detail in the Q&A if you require, but having that clear data ownership, um, having audit trails and kind of communicating what the security measures are, um, often behind kind of NDAs and other types of things, all that transparency enables people to trust that you're just monitoring for an improvement. This won't come back to bite them. If you're also collecting information about people, again, GDPR, you can't just put this, all this information in a database or in a spreadsheet that, that could come back to bite you. And whilst the UK is leaving the waterfront directive com compliance kind of as it currently stands, I believe having things that can stand upon the shoulders of giants um, to work with others is, I think, a very, very prudent approach because it's only by doing that can we really move the industry forwards um, as it is. So the penultimate slide then, these are some of the trends that I see happening. So occurring close and further. So large scale, low power devices. This is why these data loggers are incredibly low cost and easy to deploy. Um, advanced sensing and predictive insights. These are the capabilities of these probes and devices and even some satellite imagery systems to do some very, very clever calculation to, to determine things much to determine things much more of value than the raw data itself. Um, reducing carbon impacts, again, a big thing for us is ensuring that these units can be deployed for long periods of time, because if you have to keep driving around to kind of redeploy them, that's going to burn fuel, it's going to work against us. And also, there's a really large cost in just having the maintenance cycles, and that's something that I think the utilities are um, seeing is that one of the biggest outlays for their kind of spend for the next six years is trying to maintain the, oops, sorry, I'm trying to maintain these devices. So kind of our hardware, for example, cleans itself, which is a really important thing. Um, better APIs, access to data, and cloud-based management. So an API is how software hands data from one software to another. Again, we believe in that. And as I said, kind of the open access really need that kind of collaboration across the sector and as humanity as a whole, really. The close, um, so the wider adoption of fuzzy logic. So again, people who are very technical will know what I mean, but to those who are probably more normal than I am, um, when you, for example, drive your car from A to B, you accept the fact that Google Maps or Apple Maps will predict there's going to be some traffic. You accept that kind of nine times out of 10, it's accurate, maybe one out, one out of 10 times it's inaccurate, but you're happy with that kind of level of probability. So you accept that it's not a perfect measurement, but a very probable measurement. So that's fuzzy logic. It's not guaranteed. And the definition is a bit wider, but I think we're now starting to see people move towards fuzzy logic adoption rather than having to ensure that every reading is completely accurate. Um, increase score retention by monitoring these systems much more closely. We can ensure that the causality is kept when kind of people of an older age retire from the sector. Um, and also it means you don't have to have lived in an area your entire life to understand the kind of causality and what does need to be addressed with risk. And then finally, improve public understanding. So make people understand that things aren't perfect and they probably never will be but that these are the reasons for these things happening. There are macroscopic trends moving against us and people are generally trying to do their best. And then finally, in the further column, I say true co-piloting, this is what people think of when they think of AI. Um, I think once we have these kind of other subsystems closer, once we can work out causality and risk, we can work out the cost of doing something and the value it will create, we can then start to have kind of true co-piloting AI. And that's something that personally, I really hope that we get towards and something that free up is trying to um, progress. So this is the final slide. So just to summarize, and then I'm done and we're ready for the Q&A. Um, I hope that has given you a background as to the state of kind of English rivers compared to Europe and the rest of the world. It's shown some of the sectors that are contributing towards this pollution, which is just a, a state of how things have been previously, showing that the weather and other macroscopic effects are moving against us, showing that risk you need to assess down that kind of four levels of, um, kind of actionability, shown how we can help you move from no knowledge to the best knowledge available for lowest cost, the hardware that we've developed, our integration with other data sets to give you really good insights, and how over the last seven years, the three slides that encompass the adoption, um, value adds, and things not coming back to bite stakeholders are the main hurdle that we've seen. Um, and finally, the kind of trend of things to come. So that's who we are. That's why I believe in this risk mapping. And I really think that together we can make a really positive impact. So thank you for your time. And I'm now ready for Q&A, should there be any questions.
Thanks very much, Tom. That was uh, fab and love the uh, points around interoperability because I feel like that is Casco through and through. So, um, yeah, really interesting. Looks like we haven't got any Q&A questions in the log at the moment. So please, uh, anyone, feel free to drop any questions in there. But in the meantime, Simon, I'll hand over to you. Maybe you have a question or two for Tom in the meantime. Yep, I certainly do. Um, Tom, thanks very much for that. That was great. Um, really interesting stuff. I do have a question around. Um, you have your 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 you have sensors that collect data, continuous data, and then um, you take that data and build it into your sort of unified risk indicator. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the the, the what goes on between the two? Because you have the there are lots of wiggly lines essentially that, that are sort of um, the detailed data and then how does how do you know whether that you know a degree of up downiness on a wiggly line where you, and in some cases you may be blessed with more parameters than others or more sensors than others how the process of how you turn that into the kind of indicator <clears throat> so, a really good question and to and to be completely honest we're still going through the kind of and we probably will be for a very long time kind of constantly refining that with industry experts so the way that that measurement really works is if the data isn't available to do any of that it's simply grayed out as it is in the american version of this type of system and then for the species we know that are of interest to that catchment or that should be native for example things like dissolved oxygen we will use the or we are using the kind of um regulated um thresholds for example for kind of how long is there a auction depletion events and kind of what kind of level of breach will that be so we're basically building off the the regulations as they currently exist for lots of different stakeholders and and sectors and amalgamating them and we're very happy to collaborate with people to refine that further and again things like the morphology i'm um, using the kind of river scoring system um, i know that i've discussed with you the kind of like river fly method for ecological status so i think what i'd be very very clear about is if you do an assessment and there's no data on the ecology at all, that's clearly grayed out. But the moment um, that you have the riverfly method, that's better than nothing. But actually, you probably would you probably want dissolved oxygen. You want kind of better species sampling. So there's also the aspect that because it's a very high level measurement, you you want to be very clear that there's also a kind of a precision on these measurements as well. So we're still working at how we would kind of give those error bars. But I think the error bars in combination with the score would give the best depth when we try to combine all of that together we ended up back at, at that scenario where it becomes quite un, unfathomable um so we're, we're providing that and then with context beneath about the kind of precision okay thank you yeah there's some some work to do there i i think um it'll be interesting yes. um to to take that forward as so some of you watching may know but many of you won't um in the recent round of innovation funding we have applied with tom and some others to, to, to take this forward under the Casco project. We'll find out in a few weeks whether that's successful or not. So um, hopefully it will be, and we can we can really get into the bonnet of this and start to, Fingers start crossed. to use it in our in our context. Yeah. Um, I have got a question here come in from Paul um, Hume. Do you have examples of or case studies of who or where your scorecards are being used? Um, and the well, so yeah, if you take that one first, any you know, how are you getting on with kind of practical case studies? Yes, so we have a um, case study of it being used around Shrewsbury. So there was a a, a Winnet project uh, looking at water quality. So the government had paid for interventions. Um, unfortunately, the landowner group only heard of us once they put the interventions in because obviously the best scenario would be get us in before the intervention, and, that, and that's what I'm really really keen to do. Um, and then have us in afterwards. You can then actually benchmark. The impact the intervention has because i think that will then really help public funding for these types of, of efforts during our work with them we found that actually there was a water scarcity rather than a water quality problem and i think the landowners were very surprised that some of these rivers um dried up and i, I think the last time they saw that level of um, lack of water was in the 70s um so again we then worked with harper adams who did a macro invertebrate study that then informed the ecological part and the scorecards um, basically worked for harper adams being in the room and the landowners being in the room and, and as i said it made sense to the landowners that broadly this is the contact this is their score and harper adams were happy enough that yes this was something that they could build off because i know that i've discussed with you um that this needs to be something that kind of can act as a bridge between both things 
Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> other questions flying in now. Uh, you didn't mention the cost of joining FreeUp's data storage platform. So, so what do you know about, about the costs involved of, of taking part? So um, I can, of, of course, um, share costs um, if you need to. But one thing I would say ahead of that is that, and I do mean this very sincerely, um, so please take me at my word, is that what we want to do is rather than just say, here's the, the cost listing, here's what each hardware costs, this is what this costs, and please assemble your own scheme. We spent a lot of time, in fact, multiple years assembling this as a product to really, really help people. So I'd much rather people reach out to us and say, this is our problem. How can you help? Because another thing I didn't have time to share on the talk, because um, I think things that are concise are much more valuable. But as part of our approach, we uh, we we really have champion um, proxy or surrogate um, monitoring. So if you're looking, for example, for phosphate from fertilizer runoff, yes, the most rigorous way of doing that is to measure phosphates in real time. That technology is really quite expensive. You're much better off doing hand sampling, depending on other variables. But if you know that it's happening from wash-off events, measuring turbidity and rainfall can act as a proxy for only go and sample those things when you think like that's the driver kind of causing the impact. So mm -hmm. it's not the case that you would talk to us and say, I want a phosphate probe. Hopefully you'd talk to us and say, this is the problem I'm trying to fix. I'm, I'm trying to work out where I'm losing this um, nutrient from. And we can then help you say, well, actually, before you even do the phosphate monitoring directly, here's how the hardware could work in a much lower cost configuration to then build up the evidence to go and do the phosphate monitoring. Um, at the moment, for the um, software only version, um, we it should cost kind of probably about um, kind of thirty pounds a month per user um, to use the DM data platform. Now, if it's the trusts as your registered charities, we we can decrease that, and I'm happy to discuss that on a kind of person by person basis. Um, the reason for doing that is, despite building all the hardware, and again through trust, sorry, through conversations with the trust, we also know that some trusts just don't have the funds to have any hardware, no matter how low cost it is. But by having the software only version, it means that you can continue to use the hand sampling you have, have that real time data, have that weather data coming in and collaborate much more effectively. The units themselves, um, it really depends on what combination of sensing you want to um, use. But what I would say is if you have kind of sensors that measure everything, we're not going to be any more expensive than those options. And then the lower cost ones are actually significantly lower cost. So against some configurations, we are approximately 80 percent lower cost. Um, and, and have that kind of real-time nature. But again, it really does depend on the breakdown. So I would say I can provide costs. It's about £30 a month per person to be on the platform. And then depending on the exact configuration of sensing required, that will change what the costs are, but will certainly be cheaper and ideally kind of 80% for certain configurations. Thank you. Um, got a question from Michelle. Uh, so it goes over a bit of what we've said, but there's an, another element to it. Do you have some case studies where application of your technology has led to that long-term financial stability for river improvement projects that you've talked about, i.e. have you got landowners and stakeholders on board to keep maintaining interventions once the funding disappears? And I suppose what we're talking about is, is the role in, in, in that long ongoing maintenance and stewardship of a river of the kind of the data and the data platform and the, and the visualization. So, so if I understand the question correctly, it's basically saying that has the hardware either created a change that has then outlasted our deployments or is it the, that the hardware has been deployed indefinitely? Yes. Yeah. So we've just finished a project where because we had the data to show that there was a, a water kind of scarcity problem, they now have much better grounds to go in and actually have another follow up piece of funding to improve the river, river further. Um, the reason I think that has created some change, so they haven't changed their economic activities per se. But they have demonstrated now that the catchment has the um, thermal stability required for kind of um, more precise work. They've actually all been informed by the lack of water. They appreciate the economic effect that will have on them. So they're actually much more keen to look at um, water retention and leaky dam interventions. So I would say that that has created a material change to them. And we're also working with um, Harper Adams and um, some other organizations about maintaining a footprint at some of the kind of choke points on that catchment. So whilst it doesn't have the same level of precision that a higher um, density deployment does, they can act as sentinels for that deployment. So what I would say is we spent kind of seven years on this. Um, it's been really quite a long road and hopefully now we're getting towards that proof point where mm -hmm. yes, we can uh, enable those changes. Cool, thank you. Um, a couple of practical ones then, um, perhaps just quickly, 
Um, how robust are the units given our flash floods? Are they tied down or weighted? And then another one about how easy is it to pull data in and out of your software system for use with other portals? So Good question. So I'll start with the second one first. So um, hopefully um, it's a delight to pull data from our system because, again, I have a scientific background in an unrelated um, a field, really, um, and I know what it's like to kind of work up data in, in software that you like. So when you have the kind of graphical overviews, not only can you download data, but actually if you have on a graph in our system the variables you want, so say the kind of the rainfall um, and other aspects, you can just click download on 24 hour view, you'll receive a CSV file of just that data. So you don't even have to download the whole data set and then wade through it to get back to where you were. You can actually download what's showing on the graph as the raw data to work it up. You can work with APIs to get that kind of linked up in real time. Re relating to the survivability of the hardware, um, that is certainly something that's been improved over the last three years. So um, the most recent modification we had to make to the sensors were to stop leeches living in them and stop deer eating through the antenna. Um, before that, we overcame issues of flash flooding or people stealing them um, and of kind of other effects. So I would say very honestly, we started off with a floating prototype, which we quickly learned was not the correct format to put the sensors in. We then put them in a box. The boxes are always underwater, so floods don't affect it. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, the antenna and power cable acts as an umbilical um, and that shackles to a tree or a local structure and we've had some some floods where I shouldn't say this but even I've been impressed with the survivability um, we've just finished a long-term test in the sea which showed that these units are kind of um, survivable over a year with kind of the microflora and, and fauna growing on them again so we've tested over multiple seasons multiple years and the reason they sit, sit on the bottom of the river on a weight is because it's easy to carry a box and a weight. Um, it's, a, it's an easy activity to do as a human being. And also, we think it is simply the best format because they're insulated from the cold um, and unaffected by generally events. And we've also created some diagnostics, as my final comment, which will now indicate when the units become kind of buried underground or it's in the air. Because from our recent deployments, again, it's about the user knowing when the data is good or when it's basically become bad data rather than just reporting data that's being recorded. So it's all that kind of real world actionability. And I've been the person quite often doing the deployment. So I can speak from personal experience that the units are deployable at large scales. Cool, good stuff. Well, <clears throat> I think we're just about at, at, at the end of time and um, over the uh, most of the questions. Um, just a, a final comment then really about, you know, how, I mean, I would quickly add that at Casco, we're very interested in, in what you're doing and we're very keen to explore a number of ways of working together. And as we've mentioned, there are a couple of irons in the fire. Um, for other people, how do they uh, get in touch with you? Um, and what, what do you want to, to hear from people, basically? Um, so please circulate my email address um, at the end of this talk to all the attendees. Um, I presume that's possible. Um, if you have that email, then please send me an email and I'll personally respond to you. And what I would like from anyone who has an interest is we've spent a huge effort on trying to democratize water quality monitoring to give you these tools. The, what we have isn't in its final version necessarily. I'm, I'm happy to tweak it to accommodate people to kind of accommodate various deployments because I want this to work on a really big scale. So please do come to me with your problems. Please come to me with issues you have. And I really want to have many more examples of, of our technology empowering people to actually work with catchments on huge scales especially when some actors in the sector are saying it cannot be done. I really want to prove them wrong and I need your help, your problems, your time to do that. So please do get in touch. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. What a lovely positive note to end on. Um, we'll make sure that the recording is circulated as well as your contact details, Tom, to everyone. So um, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you all for your time and hope you have a fantastic week. Bye-bye.